this morning. Turn this up a little bit. Might have to turn that heat down in here today, and because uh, it'll get hot. Father, give me wisdom and the gift of teaching. I pray in Jesus' name you give the folks ears to hear and a heart to receive what we say. In thy name we pray, amen. All right, we'll continue this morning with the occult roots of this uh, modern uh, theology and the church movement and so forth. Try to bring you abreast of uh, what's going on because, believe me, a lot is going on. Some of the biggest names in the country are falling and are yielding to the uh, pressure to become part of this uh, perversion, which is called the New Age Movement, which has infiltrated the church. Turn to the book of uh, Jeremiah, chapter number 10. Jeremiah 10, verse number 1. Look at Jeremiah, chapter number 10, verse 1. All right. Jeremiah chapter number 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith Jehovah the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Now just let that settle in for a moment. It's obvious that the heathen were observing the signs of the heavens. And uh, they, uh, by doing that, of course, they were trying to make something of it, trying to understand it, trying to put some systematic order to it. Men have been looking at the stars for a long time. And as I've said to you before, uh, almost every culture on this earth that has any kind of a written record of its civilization has what's called the signs of the zodiac and the temple of Dendera in Egypt which dates back for thousands of years is one of the uh, is a good illustration a good indication of what was believed a long time ago about the signs of the zodiac now please mis don't misunderstand me I am not into astrology I do not believe in astrology astrology is a is a uh, uh, it is a superstitious uh, theo theological system based on supposition and uh, just pure uh, ignorance. Astrology has nothing to do with the Bible, but the Bible addresses everything that is important for us to understand. The Bible deals with it. And the sad thing is that so many of the churches just pass by stuff like this, have no time for it, don't even mention it. And the people suffer because of it, because they think, well, these people out here know something that the church doesn't know. They know nothing the church doesn't know Amen. when it comes to issues like this. Uh, the issue is that they will, they, will, they will entice you and hook you by, by making you believe that they have some kind of a hidden knowledge out here the church doesn't have. Immediately that causes you to question your faith. Then you say, well, if the Bible doesn't deal with this issue, then is it really the Word of God? It is the Word of God, and it deals with it. And so the book of Jeremiah says, Do not be dismayed with the signs of the heavens. The Hebrew word for signs here is the Hebrew word oath. And uh, like we would say oath. Of course, it doesn't mean at all what our English word oath means. And it's spelled O-T-H if you transliterate it into English. And what it means is that it is given there for a purpose. That the sun, the moon, the stars, and all of that are not only there for uh, day and night and for the transition from day to night, night to day and so forth and the four seasons of the year, all these things are very clearly easily observable. But the stars are in the heavens for much more than that. Look at the book of Job chapter number 38 verse 32. Now we're going to quickly move through this because I've got a lot of ground to cover and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. But just to refresh you this morning with uh, what we've talked about in time past. Job chapter number 38, verse 32. Canst thou bring forth Maseroth? That's the Hebrew word which means constellations. That's what it's talking about, the constellations in his season. Or canst thou guide Arcturus? That's a star with his sons. And chapter number 9, the book of Job in verse 9. 
Job 9, 9. The Bible says, Which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Chambers have to do with the constellations, each one of them, uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the heavens. All right. Now, so the book of Job, written probably contemporaneous with uh, Abraham, about 1,900 years before Christ, long before the Bible was ever written, is referring to the heavens, talking about the stars in the heavens, talking about the message that goes forth from them. The 19th Psalm, if you want to read that when you get home this afternoon, take a little time, look at that. You'll see that it talks about a, the stars having a message night after night. They're speaking a message. They're saying something. And as I've said to you before, that was said before the Word was ever written. The first Scripture ever written, as far as we know, was 1,400 B.C. when Moses wrote the Pentateuch, except the book of Job, because the book of Job dates about 1,900 B.C., somewhere in there, and, uh, and uh, therefore predates the Pentateuch. And the book of Job goes back to an ancient time before priesthood, before any of these things that the Old Testament talks about. So we know it's old. We know it's ancient. And we know that ancient knowledge, the ancients had knowledge of the heavens. So how many of you were alive in the 60s when they started singing about the age of Aquarius? You remember the song? It was a Broadway, Broadway production called Hair. And that's where the song was introduced. The age of Aquarius caught on. It was the top ten. I don't know. It might have gone to the top of the charts and uh, there for a while. And, uh, but what it was far more than just a song because the age of Aquarius is dealing with the beginning or the dawning of a new age, a new, pe a new period of time. You see, these people believe very strongly that each age uh, will affect mankind in a certain way. And that an age will run a certain period of time or a certain period of years. The average is about 2,100 years or so is an age. That's amazing how that corresponds with uh, the New Testament because 2,000 years ago the Lord Jesus was here and went to the cross and died. The age that you are in now, according to astrology, is the age of Aquarius. Aquarius is the man with a water pitcher. It's supposed to be an age of peace and love, and unity, and prosperity. And therefore, when you saw the people with their peace symbols, the upside-down broken cross back in the early 60s, that's associated with the age of Aquarius. Free love that you saw beginning to develop back in the 60s. And, of course, you see the product of it today. 25% of all the young ladies in this country, teenagers, 25% have a sexually transmitted disease, one quarter, one quarter of all of the kids in this country, and syphilis itself is on, on the rise, increasing dramatically. Syphilis is a very dangerous thing. It can kill you. So uh, free love's not free. They're paying the price for it. It's costing dearly. It's costing in broken homes, so forth and so on. But we're not up here to preach. We're up here to teach. Amen. <laughs> the age of Aquarius was a time of free love, a time of prosperity, a time of unity, a time of consciousness, of, of when mankind became conscious of his cosmic place on earth, that his cosmic role, in other words, a unity, a oneness of the earth, a oneness of mankind. That's why you had so much of this stuff back in the 60s, uh, the flower children and all of that. That's the bedawning of the age of Aquarius. And that's supposed to be where we are now. We are in the age of Aquarius. Depends on what authority you deal with. Some say it takes as much as three to four hundred years to transition from one age into the next age. Because we're talking about long periods of time. The age that immediately preceded the age of Aquarius is the age of Pisces. The one that immediately preceded that is the age of Arius. The one that preceded that is the age of Taurus. But all you have to do is take a chart and look at the signs, the constellations, and go backward. Because the, re the way they measure this, without getting too technical, the way they measure this is what's called the precession of the equinoxes. They go backward. And the way you tell that is, if you know, you know that the, 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 the spring equinox is soon to come. All right. That's spring. Dates are, dates are irrelevant. Spring is when the sun is over the equator, and the night and the day is equal. That's spring. And from that moment on, 
then you, are, you have entered into spring. Equinox means equal, night and day in length, but you have to be at a certain point on earth to have that. So the equinox begins the spring cycle. And the, if you go out at night, if you go out at night, look up into the stars at the spring equinox, you will see the stars located a certain area. The way to fix that is to see where the moon rises. All right? You see where it comes up in the stars at night. All right. If you could live 2,100 or 2,200 years, you would see, instead of the stars coming up in a constellation that you saw 2,100 years ago, it will be coming up in the constellation before that. The stars are literally moving over your head, they appear to be moving. That's called the precession of the equinoxes. And so therefore it moves from one constellation into the next, into the next, into the next, but it takes a long time for it to move from one to the next. At the time of Christ 2,000 years ago when the moon came up at night, it came up in a different constellation than it comes up in now. That's the best way to put that. Okay. So this is the age of Aquarius. This is the age of freedom, the age of love, the age of peace, the age of prosperity, the age of all of these, these this is bringing together this age. Now, when it started as the age of Aquarius, it was an astrological thing connected with, the, connected with astrology, but it became a very religious thing because the, the young people in that age embraced it. And they not only embraced that, they embraced the drugs that went with it, hallucinogenic drugs like LSD. That's big back in the 60s. And uh, 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 any kind of a drug that would put you on a trip, not just make you feel good, they wanted to be on a trip. And so LSD, of course, would put you on a trip. And you take LSD today, six months later, have another trip. That's the problem with LSD. But in any event, all this stuff happened back in the 60s. And what it did was begin to change the whole culture of this country. The culture was changed. And I observed that. Watch that happen. I got saved in 1973. So from 1973 to this date, I have observed the changing of the culture of the church. But the culture of the world began to change dramatically back in the 60s. Well, this age of Aquarius morphed, changed its form into what's called the New Age. And the New Age is something that encompasses far more than simply what an astrologer would look up and begin to read the star. The New Age encompasses all of the Hindu religions and all of the esoteric religions in the world, begin to pull them in. And when it first came out, people stood back. Remember at East Town, when, the new, when they first built East Town, there was a store over there that sold crystals and all kinds of paraphernalia associated with the New Age movement. It was blatant, open. Let you know without a question, this is what it's about. You see music and uh, mantras and yoga and star, uh, crystals and all kinds of things that had magic attached to them and so forth, where you could communicate with your higher self and with spirit guides and all of this stuff. That's what the New Age is about. You say, well, that's wild stuff. What's that got to do with the church? A whole lot. Because it's in the church. That's the point. So back in the early 60s, all of this stuff started. The hippie movement, free love, which you know is not free. There's a price to be paid for it. And kids are paying the price dearly today. Our marriages are breaking up at the rate of two marriages. One breaks up. And people are paying for it because the Spirit has uh, done that. Now let's go back and look at just a little theology. Let's go back and look at the people who are far more serious about what they believe than some little dope crazed yippie or hippie back in the 60s playing uh, the age of Aquarius. Let's talk about people who have dedicated their lives to the study of the occult and have incorporated that into their belief. And these are people who you might call them, you may call them a Satanist, you may call them Theosophy, which is, theosophy means the love of theology or the love of wisdom, a theological love of wisdom that you don't have like the Gnostics have, you know. It's always this idea that you're a poor old dumb Christian out here in church, don't know a thing. You're stupid. If you just let us initiate you and teach you the greater truths, then you wouldn't be what you are. We could show you what it's all about. That's the idea. That's what Oprah Winfrey's show's about, by the way. It's to teach you that. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, man, a, a, a lady named Madame H.B. Blavats Blavatsky, Annie Besant, Alice Bailey, Edgar Casey, the Sleeping Prophet, Aleister Crowley, Benjamin Krem, and it comes on up to the present day. These people laid the foundation for what became the New Age movement. 
They laid the theological foundation for it. So what you have here is a merger of ideology when you've got the age of Aquarius and you've got this mystical blah, blah, blah. But you've got these people over here that are laying the very foundation for what the, they're going to believe. And they incorporate anything. Hinduism will incorporate anything. Hinduism has many, many millions of gods. And theosophy, the occult, Satanism, and all the rest of it goes back to one granddaddy religion of all of it, and that's Hinduism. And Hinduism and Buddhism have common roots. They came from the same source, Brahman. And these are the, this, is the, this is the foundational basis of all of the foolishness that's going on today. Mark it down. It is consciousness. It's all about consciousness and about greater gods and about attaining godhood and about, about seeing self as what self really is and the God within and all of this stuff that you're hearing today. That's what it's about. It's about that. It's Hinduism. But, of course, being Americans, we've anglicized it. I mean, we'll take anything, polish it up, and remake it, and package it if we can make a dollar off of it. Amen. Remember. If, uh, if you can't figure it out, there's money behind it. <laughs> My wife said something to me that said, that doesn't make a lick of sense. I said, yeah, somebody's making money. <laughs> That's truth. <laughs> you can put that down in your book. If it doesn't make any sense, somebody's making a dollar bill off of it. And Americans are good at that. Very good. Very good. So they repack repackage it, and they give it out in the churches today, and it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's that kind of thing. Now, a hundred years after Christ, a man by the name of Serenthus died. He believed this. He believed that Jesus Christ went to the cross with the Christ consciousness on him. With this spirit that had come down, this consciousness, this, this Hindu mystic belief that there is a, that there is a, a cosmic power that surrounds the earth. And all you have to do is tap into that and, and you can become an avatar. You can become this great godlike thing that, that, that receives this, this, this great teaching in yourself and it's called an anointing. And this is what Serenthus believed. He believed that Jesus Christ that lived 2,000 years ago, and of course Serenthus is what you'd call a Gnostic, but Gnostics come in all kinds of different flavors. It's like uh, uh, that ice cream place. It's got 64 flavor, whatever it is. A lot of different Gnostics. Serenthus believed that the Christ consciousness came on Christ and then when he went to the cross to die, it left him. And so at the cross, he just died a man. Now, the apostle John confronted him, met him face on. John the apostle was one of the twelve. And John the apostle is one who laid his head on the bosom of Jesus Christ, said, we have handled the word of God. That's what he said. Now, there's no indication that Serenthus ever met Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no indication Serenthus ever saw him. You see, he formed his theology about Jesus Christ totally devoid of any contact with a man whatsoever. Didn't even know him. John knew him. John knew when he died. And John saw him alive. And John saw him glorified at the right hand of the Father. And John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, book of Revelation. He's an apostle. He said, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. Luke did. He said, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. See, this gets into the eye of the doctrine of apologetics where you're trying to take the Scripture and show people why we believe. That's what it's about. We were there, they said. They, they said, we saw him. Serenthus, I have no indication Serenthus ever knew he was even alive till afterward. But Serenthus was, was infected with Hinduism. He was infected with Gnosticism. So what he did was to take the, the idea of Jesus Christ and repackage it and refashion it and say, well, here's another avatar. By the way, they teach that from the time he was 13 years old until the time that he showed up at the Jordan River and John the Baptist baptized him, that his father Joseph, stepfather, you know, father, took him to Tibet and took him to eastern lands, to the Hindu, and took him to the great uh, gurus of his day, and they taught him these great truths about his Christ consciousness and about this great power that could be tapped into. And so when Jesus Christ showed up the Jordan River, he had become a Christ. Are you saying that a bunch of junk, preacher? That's what New Agers believe. And that's what these preachers that are embracing the New Age movement will accept. 
as I've told you 10,000 times, the most important thing in this church or any church is not what you believe about, is not about millennialism, premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial, or what you believe about church polity, or whether you believe a baptismal pool is scriptural or not, or you ought to be baptized in a river with running water or a lake or whatever. The most important thing you'll ever deal with, bar none, is who is Jesus Christ. Everything revolves around that. If you get him wrong, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter, folks. It does not matter. I don't care what you believe. If you don't have Jesus Christ right, whatever you believe is meaningless. Who is he? He's the God-man. Well, if he's the God-man, then he's not just the Christ, is he? And if you notice, there's not a lot of emphasis in the New Testament put on the Christ. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called the Christ of God. But any liberal for 40, 50 years, the liberals have always been, have always said the Christ, the Christ, the Christ. When you hear any man talking about the Christ, the Christ, who are you talking about? You talking about the Lord Jesus Christ? When somebody says the Christ, that doesn't mean anything to me. That's an empty phrase. That's nothing. Because the Bible says that Satan is the Christ also because he's the anointed one. But Jesus Christ is the Christ of God. He's the Lord's anointed, the Bible says. And anyway, the New Age movement, they believe in Christ consciousness. And that's what Serenthus taught. The agrarian gospel teaches that Jesus Christ went off. The Issa paper teaches that he went off. And, of course, they never met him. None of these people ever met him. They didn't know him. No, none of them knew him firsthand. You know what I'm saying? This stuff was created out of thin air. What's the authority for it? The Apostle John knew him. And if Christ be not risen from the dead, let's go home. Amen. They don't like the resurrection. They do not like the doctrine of the resurrection. So therefore, here, here are some of the major tenets of it. The Christ consciousness, Christ comes on him. It's the Christ consciousness. It's not Christ like you understand. It's a spirit that comes upon him, a consciousness, a a Godhood likeness that comes upon him and then leaves him. They don't believe in the, in, in the existence of sin. Sin's a non-issue with these people. They believe in universalism. They believe, therefore, that, uh, that everybody's the same, that all we have to do is find our God within, our Christ consciousness ourselves, so forth and so, so on. That's pantheism, as I told you before. And I quoted to you from the New Century Version. I don't think I have that with me today. But I quoted to you from the New Century Version last week which is one of the most corrupt pieces of garbage ever made. And the New Century Virgin, uh, Version teaches that God is in everything. And that's a piece of corrupt junk. Isn't it good God gave you a Bible? Amen. Oprah and Friends started in January 2008. She's broadcasting over satellite radio worldwide. You can also get the broad... I don't know if I ought to advertise or not for <laughs> But anyway, she's broadcasting worldwide over satellite radio. And satellite radio is recently a new invention, and obviously by its name, that means you can go anywhere. If you can reach the satellite, if you can pick it up, you can pick up this thing. She has uh, on her website, she has a little section set aside for Mary Ann Williamson. Mary Ann Williamson is without question a dyed-in-the-wool, uh, full-blown New Ager, makes no bones about it. Being a full-blown New Ager, then she talks about Jesus Christ, but she talks about him in the sense that I told you a moment ago. Sure he lived, sure he was here, sure he did wonderful things, but he did them by his Christ consciousness. You know all of that just like you can. He's no different from you. He's not the Son of God, as the Bible uh, plainly says he is. So here's what Oprah says, special offer for Oprah's fans. Tune into Oprah and Friends, Oprah's 24-7 channel on XM, now featuring Oprah's weekly Soul Series radio show. She's an evangelist. Listen in every week as Oprah interviews leading scholars and teachers in the spiritual and lifestyle realm and shares insights into her own life. Plus, she invites listeners to reflect on their own spiritual journeys. That's a buzzword. Watch them when they start using the term journey. Watch that. Here's spiritual journeys. It's talk radio that stimulates your brain and feeds your soul. See what we got? That's not hard to interpret. I mean, she's above board with it. My issue is not with Oprah Winfrey personally. I'm a teacher and a preacher and have a, a God-given responsibility to teach you the truth. I'm doing my job. I'm doing what I'm called to do. 
This is what I'm supposed to do. One of the reasons we're in the biggest mess we're in now is because preachers have not done what they're supposed to do. My people destroyed for lack of knowledge. So what is this new message? Well, here's a little summation of it. It's pretty good. I am the Jesus of today's liberal theology of inclusive, politically correct universalism. I'm only a human man. I was not born of a virgin, nor did I actually rise from the dead. Unfortunately, as a Jewish rabbi, I attracted such devoted followers that even after my death, they wanted to keep my spirit alive, so to speak. And so they went and built this elaborate theology around me, which is largely based on the writings of that rascal Paul. Amen. Sadly, they ended up making me into a god. I taught the most important thing we can do is to love one another. You see, that's all that matters because we are the brotherhood of man. No one should ever criticize what another person honestly believes about God. You should, you've been inundated with that day in and day out. You're getting that in the face every time you turn around. After all, we're all God's children. And you better watch out for some of God's children. They'll blow your brains out, knock your door down, come and get you at night. And even though we may take different paths of religion in this life, as all religions please God if they are sincere, so therefore I'll, just as long as you're sincere, in the end we'll all be with God because everyone is going to be saved. Man is too good to be condemned. God is too good to condemn him. As long as you love one another, it really doesn't matter to God what you believe about him. He's just delighted if you believe in him. Oh, God's tickled to death if you take time for him. What did Paul God do for eternity before you ever showed up? You've added so much to his life. <laughs> Paul God's bored to death without me. Isn't that a bunch of garbage? Well, Rick Warren, America's pastor, and I'm showing you now what I've done is laid the foundation, showed you how that the age of Aquarius merged into the New Age movement, that it's occult roots, showed you how that theosophy, Satanism, occultism, and all, all the rest of it, I've showed you how that it's all funneling together into one thing. Now I'm going to show you how that Christian leaders are bringing it right into the church. Okay? Now that's what's important. If it stayed out there, that's one thing. But if you bring it right into the church, then who's responsible to tell you about that? Listen to this. Lighthouse Trails Research Project. All you have to do is type Google, Google Lighthouse Trails. You can find the same website. While Rick Warren is gearing up to train a billion people, thousand, that's a thousand million, unbeknownst to many, he has also been teamed up with New Age and contemplative promoter Ken Blanchard. For some time now, according to a new biography of Rick Warren, A Life with Purpose, written by George Meyer, Rick Warren has solicited the services of Ken Blanchard to aid him in training leaders. Rick taps the best and most famous to help train church leaders to be like Jesus. He has hired Ken Blanchard to come to Saddleback to help train people how to be effective leaders. There is countless evidence to show that Blanchard sits on the New Age mystical contemplative bandwagon. Now let's just put two and two together. Would you get a New Ager to teach you how to be like Jesus? If you get a new ager, what kind of Jesus do you suppose he's going to teach you to be like? Because the Apostle Paul said, if any man come to you preaching any other Jesus, let him be anathema. And that word anathema doesn't just mean I'm going to say a bad word about him. That word anathema means curse from God with no hope of recovery. Any other Jesus. The New Testament's real strict about that. It says if one man esteems one day above another, okay, you know, don't get in a big dog fight over it. But when you start messing around with Jesus, you're going to get in trouble. Amen. See? Amen. That's right. So, Blanchard makes no apology when he says, much can be gained from Buddhism. Did you hear that? Let me say that again. Let me say, let's say this. Let's say I had a man in here to preach Sunday night, and he got up in front of you and said, much can be gained from Buddhism. You'd say, Preacher Lawson, I haven't leaned to have a talk with you here now. Did you know where this guy came from? Well, no, really, I didn't. I just liked his looks, you know. I mean, I thought he was pretty. <laughs> right, sound of his voice. Or, I like the kind of clothes he wore. Do you realize that our society is so shallow today that you could take the people that are going to vote in this presidential election and say, well, what is your candidate's position on NAFTA? What's NAFTA? 
Well, say, what's your candidate's position on health care? Well, I've got health care. What's your candidate's position on that? In other words, they don't have a clue. Amen. They just like his or her looks. Yeah. Or they feel good when they get around them, yeah. hear him speak, or something like that. But anyway, Blanchard makes no apology when he says, much can be gained from Buddhism. I say to you, Mr. Blanchard, with all due respect, sir, there is nothing that I can gain from Buddhism. Amen. Right. He and his wife both encouraged the practice of yoga, mantra meditation. Ken Blanchard, Rick Warren, and Bill Hybels have become team players at the Lead Like Jesus conferences, which take place across North America. These three also have an audio set they co-authored together. You say, when I preach, what these guys got to do with the church? I mean, after all, these are, these are some fellows stuck well. No, they've got everything in the world to do with the church. Hybels Church up there outside Chicago, Illinois, is with the granddaddy of feel-good religion. You, call, you walk in that place, you think you're in Starbucks. You, thought you, you, you think you've gone to a, a musical concert. Well, you've, when, you, when you walk in there and they get through talking to you, you feel good about yourself and the great potential within you. And uh, Rick Warren, of course, has cloned himself all over this country. We've got Rick Warren cloned churches here in Knoxville, Tennessee. They're clones, folks. This is not in the sense of just simply being critical to be critical. This is in the sense of being critical to show you a comparison. You better hold on to what you got. Amen. The truth is the truth. Amen. And I just read a name this morning of a pastor out in California, and I'm going to do some more research on this man. I just read a name, and he's all over the country on the radio. You've heard him time and again. And now he's beginning to associate himself with the same New Age crowd. And I thought to myself, my goodness, man. I thought you had better sense than that. Because I'd heard him teach the Bible time and again, and, he, and he's a good expositor of the Scriptures. He knows the Bible. Yet here he is embracing New Age doctrine. Well, embrace, embracing New Age teachers, put it that way. <clears throat> so the church is bringing New Age teachers into its conferences to teach people to be like Jesus. There's something wrong with that, isn't there? Whatever happened to get on your knees and get right with God and pour your heart out and be filled with the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Spirit of God lead you in the ministry? Rick Warren has invited New Age proponent Leonard Sweet to speak at a 2008 Saddleback Small Groups Conference called Wired. The theme of the conference is Prepare Your Church for Spiritual Growth and Connectivity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, spiritual growth and connectivity a la Leonard Sweet, could be a pantheistic, mystical dose of the New Age. And it isn't the first time Warren has found com comradeship with Sweet. As Ray Youngen explains in A Time of Departing, Sweet and Warren came together in 94 for their Tides of Change audio series. Youngen describes Warren and Sweet's relationship as well as Sweet's belief. The acknowledgment section of Quantum Spirituality shows very clearly Sweet's spiritual sympathies. In its sweet thanks, interspiritualist universalists such as Matthew Fox, author of The Coming Cosmic Christ, Episcopalian priest mystic Morton Kelsey, Willis Harmon, author of Global Mind Change, and Ken Wilber, one of the major intellectuals in the New Age movement, for helping him to find what he calls new light. Sweet adds that he trusts the spirit that led the author of the cloud of unknowing. You better be careful when you start messing with spirits. The Apostle John warned in 1 John, try the spirits. How do you try them? Number one, what's their doctrine? Spirit starts talking to you, talk back to it. I asked one the other day, I said, what do you believe about Jesus Christ? I didn't hear another word from him. So get out of here and leave me alone. <laughs> They're intelligent beings. If you try to ignore them, they'll work you over. When you speak to a spirit, it must acknowledge. It may, not have to, it may not do it exactly then, but if you belong to Jesus Christ, you're walking with God, you've got the power of the blood that was shed at Calvary that defeated these spirit beings. That is your weapon. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb. Try them. And today you better try every preacher you hear. 
You better try every church you go into. Just because they've got a cross and a song book and a piano and an organ doesn't mean at all it's a Christian church. This is the most deceptive time you've ever lived in. Many of you have members in your own family and your own family are near you that are members of occult churches that profess to be Christian. In the preface of the book, Sweet disseminates line after line of suggestions that the old teachings of Christianity must be replaced with new teachings of the new light. These new teachings, he believes, will draw from ancient teachings. This new light movement, Sweet says, a radical faith commitment that is willing to dance to a new rhythm. Remember, Rick Warren has invited New Age proponent Leonard Sweet. Leonard Sweet says, the old teachings of Christianity must be replaced with new teachings of the new light. So what do you think is going to be taught at the Saddleback Small Groups Conference called WIRED? Here's the way they do it. It's called semantics. That's one of those little words that has big meaning. Semantics. What's that mean? Well, we all use words. We use words to communicate with each other. All right? If I say hot to you, what, do you, what does immediately come to your mind? You're going to get burned. Better leave this thing alone. It's hot. All right? If I say cold, you say, well, I, you know, could freeze, shiver, could what have you, all right? In other words, that's a word that has a universal meaning, see, within the English language. The words are commonly understood. There's, you don't have to define them. But here's what happens with semantics. Semantics takes the word like Jesus, all right? Seventy-five years ago, if I'd, have, if I'd have said the word Jesus in the average church in this country, do you know what, my re what reply would I have gotten? Son of God. Son of God? Savior? Anything else? What is the most important thing about Jesus Christ? I know He's the Son of God. But they can twist that and spin that to say, well, Jews in the Old Testament, Israel's called the sons of God. And angels are called the sons of God. So forth and so on. You know, we're sons of God by the new birth. And that's not to belittle the term Son of God. But what is the most definitive term of Jesus Christ of all in the Bible? There is nothing can be said greater than that. Well, that has to do with what he did. I'm talking about who he is, his nature, his essence, the God-man, God in the flesh. Nothing greater can be said. When Thomas said, my Lord and my God, you don't get any higher than that. A Jew saying that is saying there's only one God. Hear you, O Israel, the Shema. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. All right. So when I said the term Jesus 75 years ago, it was universally accepted that that meant that he's the Savior, the Son of God, the God-man. Now what does it mean today? Here's what it means. When Mr. Gore said, the other, uh, said a few months back, he said, your faith tradition. That's a buzzword. That means something. When you hear somebody say faith tradition, what he says is that you've got your faith, he's got his faith, he's got his faith, he's got his faith. You know, in other words, your faith is no more important than his faith. That's your faith tradition. That's what you were raised in. Faith tradition. In other words, if you're born in the Bible Belt here, Bible Belt here in East Tennessee, you know, you, you came from uh, uh, the people that came from the area over there, the, the Scotch-Irish that settled western North Carolina, Virginia, eastern Tennessee, these mountain people. You can take the violins that they play up here in these mountains, go back over there in Ireland, listen to them play, and you'll see there's a direct connection. All right? So you've got these people that settled this area in here in the Bible Belt, and they've been preaching all these years. And you come in here, and, 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 and this is your faith tradition, all right? But then you go up north. And up north, you have Catholics, a lot of Catholics. You have a lot of Catholics up north. You've got a lot here in Knoxville. But you've got a lot more up there, okay? That's their faith tradition, okay? Then you're going up in areas up in Germany, up, like in, in, in uh, Holland, Michigan, places like that. The Dutch came from, from Holland. They settled, all right? It, they've got a covenant theology. That's their faith tradition, all right? You, you travel around to one place to the other and you come upon faith traditions. Don't ever judge anybody else's faith. The worst thing you could ever do is to say, hold on, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. That's anathema. Political correctness says, oh, you don't ever say that. In the public school system, they'll take your children and teach them. Uh, they'll teach them that they need to, they, they'll teach them, what is it, what's that course they give them where they say, Sensitivity training. 
where you don't want to offend anybody. You see, you don't offend anybody. All right? well, the idea is to brainwash them. That's what it's all about. Faith tradition. So semantics has gotten to the point now with the name of Jesus where it doesn't mean anything. Somebody said, oh, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, but what do you believe about Jesus? I'm a Christian. Oh, are you really? Well, what does that mean to you? You see what I mean? That's where we are now. That's where the church is. All right. Have you ever heard of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Skull and Bones at Yale? Have you ever heard of the uh, Bilderbergers? Have you ever heard of the Bohemian Grove? Well, we're talking about elitists now. We've taken a step upward. All right. We're dealing with you on the level of the, of the masses. Remember, in order to control the people, you've got to separate these people. You've got to give the masses something that keeps them stagnant, keeps them. So what have they done? They've given them sex, drugs, and they're controlling them more by the day. Who's doing the controlling? The elite. All right. The elite have their gods too. The love of money is the root of all evil. But I'm going to tell you right now, there are very few atheists in this world. Oh, I know. They've got their websites. I've logged on to them, listened to them haul and crawl and carry on. And I think you're acting like a 12-year-old. The dumbest thing you ever heard in your life. You know, there's no God. And bless this and so forth and so on, so forth and so on. But there really are very few atheists. So the, so the elite have their gods. And the elite's God basically is his brain. He thinks he's better than you are. He thinks he's smarter than you are. He thinks he's entitled more than you are. He thinks that he's entitled to a privileged position above you. So therefore, he's going to use you. And whatever he has to do to use you, manipulate you, to get what he wants and to keep him where he feels like he should be because of his position, he'll do that to you. He'll only give to you what he has to give you to keep you happy. That's all. And you can see it right now as it's manipulating as they're manipulating the stock markets and the cost of fuel. You're paying $3 and something for a gallon of gasoline. I saw yesterday where it's $5.25 in some areas. You say, well, it's the Arabs over there. They're charging us so much more for a barrel of oil. Do you realize that the value of a dollar bill has dropped? The value of a dollar bill has dropped. And as the value of a dollar bill drops, the Saudi Arabian says, well, I'm going to tell you what. Since your money doesn't buy as much, you're going to pay more for this barrel of oil. And when they pay more for the barrel of oil, the cost of a gallon of gasoline goes up. Why has the value of the dollar dropped so much? Because the Federal Reserve is pumping billions and billions and billions of dollars into the market, into the, into the hands of the people. They're moving the money supply. They just bailed out one of the largest mortgage firms in the country. They just bailed them out. They're going to cut the interest rate this coming Tuesday, probably, down to the lowest point that it's been, I guess, ever. I don't know. It's going to be cut. There's a lot of things happening right now on the, on the financial scene. Do you know when you go to the store, I'm running out of time. How many ever go to Walmart? How many don't go to Walmart? When you buy a product at Walmart, a lot of the products you buy at Walmart come from China. Now, here's a strange thing about China and the dollar bill. Now, this, is, this is remarkable. Your dollar bill is directly tied to the mon to money in China. If your dollar bill drops, their money drops. If your dollar bill goes up, their money goes up. In other words, it is tied together. It's not tied to the Swiss franc. It's not tied to British pound but, or the European euro. But it is tied to the Chinese. They don't like that because they're watching it go down. Here's, why, here's, how, here's how it works out. Here's, here's the simple fact of it. That is that you haven't really seen the impact of what's going on in the financial part of this country because the products you're buying at Walmart are coming from China and China's having to sell them to us for the same price that they were six months a year ago because their money's tied to our money and it's gone down. So you're buying it at Walmart and that forces Target and all the rest of them to compete with Walmart. So it keeps the prices artificially low. But you ever let them break that between China and America? You let them break that, and here's what's going to happen. The prices of the stuff on the shelves at Walmart's going to shoot up just like that. They're already telling you that food's going up because it doesn't come from China. <laughs> See, the milk doesn't come from China. You're paying $5 for a gallon of milk. Why? 
because uh, it's not tied with them, so therefore you're seeing the actual effect of the devaluation of your money on what you're buying. Now, here's the question you ought to ask yourself. Who's controlling this? What's going on? It's coming two ways, and I'll shut up. It's coming through the religious church to have a one-world church, and it's coming through the political area to control the economy. And just think about this. What a scenario. What if it got so bad that a gallon of gasoline was six or seven bucks and a gallon of milk was ten dollars and people started screaming to high heaven and saying, we can't live like this. You're going to have to do something to help us. And go back and read the book of Daniel, chapter number 10. And it says that the Antichrist will cause things to prosper in his hand. Maybe they're creating a crisis to where the Antichrist can step in and come in with the answer and turn everything around. And when he does, of course, they'll take the mark in a heartbeat. Brother Rayleigh dismisses, please.